Okie dokie. So, here we are. Why are you not closing? Thank you. Today, we have murder, mystery, and coffee. And your mom, if you brunk her. Only if you brunk her, you're allowed to stay. Well, today's lovely episode is Jeray Mikhail Wilson in Weatherford, Oklahoma, in October 2012. Okay, so the police had to look for more than one year before locating her body. The help of a tip. The documentary, which uh, was on Text Me When You Get Home, is where I originally saw it. Uh, Hulu, maybe? Maybe Netflix? I don't know. The documentary materially untangles the various layers of the case and offers a clear understanding of the way the events played out. So, let's jump right into it and show. How did Jeray Wilson die? <clears throat> Excuse me. Born on September 4th, 1996 in Rutherford, Custer County, Oklahoma, Jeray Mikhail Wilson was the daughter of Rodney and Jahar Rasmussen Wilson, which I really enjoy because they combine their names to make their daughter's name. So, Jera and Rodney, Jeray. <laughs> Okay, she was a student of Weatherford High School. The 16-year-old loved playing many musical instruments, such as the guitar and the trumpet, as well as singing and listening to music. Apart from those, she was also passionate about horse riding, drawing, and snowmobiling. She had an adorable laugh and was loved by her parents' family in the small community of Weatherford. So it came a real shock when she did not return home on October 14, 2012. She was last seen in a surveillance image of a convenience store, busy texting on her phone. Search was mounted by the Weatherford Police, her family, and other volunteers for the community. They looked, looked, and looked, but never found any traces of the 16-year-old. The community feared that she might have been a victim of human trafficking. Wilson's family put up posters, distributed feelers, and even held a prayer vigil on the 15th of every month until her body turned up around 14 months later. Based on the tip, the investigators found her remains in a rural Custard County field about two miles north of Weatherford on December 17, 2013. They uncovered the human remains from a shallow grave after an officer noticed a shallow grave. They noticed a skull sticking out. Her autopsy report showed that the skull had two bullet wounds shot with a 22 caliber pistol. When I watched this one, um, it wasn't exactly that. It was more of there was two to three people that were involved. And uh, when they finally went around asking people, you know, they went through her text message and uh, who she was hanging out with last and all that stuff. Pretty much was, I want to say one was feeling really guilty or something. And uh, they were like, we know where her body is. I'm, I'm done. I, I can't do this guilt anymore. It's driving me insane. And so they walked for a good minute before they actually went in there. And the dude was like, hey. It's somewhere in this area. I can't tell you. It's been a year. Everything looks identical. And and uh, they said in the even after she was dead, she was a ray of sunshine because there was a shine of light bouncing off the white part of her skull. So she was still there trying to tell them where they were. They said so. While the police were still searching for Wilson's body, Cody Godfrey came. For after 14 months of confessed to being a witness, see, that's who it was, okay, for being a witness and accessory to the crime, it was his testimony that helped the investigators identify the events that led Wilson's disappearance and her demise, as well as her killer. Within a few hours of discovery of the body, the Oklahoma Bureau of Narcotics arrested Tucker Ryan McGee, 
on first degree murder charge. Slowly, the investigators started to unravel the threads of events that happened October 14, 2012. Cody testified that on the way to pick up Wilson, Tucker showed him a gun and said, You can kill Jeray. After picking Wilson up, the trio went to smoke synthetic marijuana named K2 in a desert field north of Westfield. Cody claimed that while smoking, Tucker got irritated by Wilson speaking too much about her problems. Sensing something was wrong, Wilson texted her friend, Trey Gloria. I feel sketched out. I can't go home. As Wilson was busy on her phone, Cody claimed Tucker shot her with a gun. According to Cody, she never saw it coming. He added that after shooting her once, Tucker found out that Wilson was still moaning and shot her again before throwing her body over a fence and concealing it underneath a tree. Cody added that he and Tucker proceeded to smoke some more of the K2 before getting rid of Wilson's backpack and purse by throwing them in a dumpster at a car wash near the Jiffy Trip in Westford. I have dry mouth. We need coffee. They returned the next day after school in Kayla McLemore's car to bury Wilson's body. Tucker also destroyed her phone and scattered the pieces into the nearby creek. Cody then led the police to the teenager's body. So, what happened to the boys? Cody, Godfrey, Caleb, Lamore, and Tucker McGee. The prosecutors wanted to pursue the death penalty for Tucker McGee, but settled for life imprisonment since he was just 10 days shy of his 18th birthday at the time of the murder. On March 3rd, 2015, Tucker was convinced of the charge of the first-degree murder by the jury. He was sentenced to life prison without the possibility of parole in April 2015. However, the Oklahoma legislature forbade judges to sentence minors to life imprisonment without the possibility of parole. Thus, an appeals court overturned the former sentencing. Tucker was resentenced to life in prison with a possibility of parole for 38 years in June 2018. As per official court records, Tucker McGee is presently incarcerated in a cell in the Lawson Correction facility in Oklahoma. Caleb McLemore pled guilty to be an accessory after the fact in Wilson's death in January 2015 and was sentenced to 25 years in prison. He needed to serve at least 10 years of the sentence, the remaining 15 years suspended. As per records, he is presently out of jail. As a part of a plea agreement, Cody was given seven years probation after being found guilty of the accessory to murder after the fact. Wilson's parents tried to per push Senate Bill 1221 that was set the motion for evaluating minors convicted of murder and give judges instead of a jury the power to sentence them to life in prison without the chance of the parole. However, the governor of the state vetoed the bill. So, they say they last heard from their daughter, Jeray, around 5 p.m. the day before. Jeray and Rodney did admit that Jeray had left their house a week earlier because they had grounded her. They were trying to get Jeray to return home, but Jeray ran through things on her own. She said that she would come home if her parents got rid of the, her curfew, but they said no. Jeray stayed in constant communication with her daughter. They would say good night, good morning. But all that changed on October 14th. Jeray said that she last heard from Dre at 5 p.m. She tried to send her a message and call around 10 p.m., but there was no answer. But in the last hours that Jerry disappeared, Jerry and Ronnie turned to the social media Facebook and put up missing posters all over the town. At first, the police told the Wilsons that Jerry had probably run away, but they eventually issued an Amber Alert and began to take case more serious. The police obtained her cell phone records. And she had her last pinged on October 14th at 7 p.m. And it hadn't been used since. Jerry was in contact with multiple people all day long. But the police couldn't see the actual test message because they only had records. The police spoke to Jerry's friend. They learned that Jerry had become dropped off at a gas station at 1.45 p.m. And was picked up at 2.15 by a friend driving a tan Volvo. The friend said that he took Jerry to a friend's house. But he left to go hang out with Cody Goffrey and Tucker McGee. Cody and Tucker told the police that they drove around for a few hours and dropped Jay Ray off the university apartments around 7 p.m. Their story seemed to match Jay Ray's phone records and her phone last pinned near the apartments. Possible theories. During the investigation, the police learned that Jay Ray had been dating an older man. 
The man was 25 years old and had a history of drug use and possession. When the police tracked him down, he was in jail. He didn't seem concerned about Jay Ray's disappearance. He said, I wasn't involved. He did tell the police that Jay Ray had sent him a message about owing someone named Gilberto some money. Gilberto was a local drug dealer and claimed to have connection to the cartel and human trafficking. The Oklahoma Bureau of Narcotics became involved because Jay Ray had told some friends that she feared that she would be sold into human trafficking. The police told Gilberto down he was also in jail for drug charge. Gilberto, also knowing Jay Ray, said that he had mutual friends would sometimes give her rides. Gilberto said that he wasn't involved in Jay Ray's disappearance. He agreed to take a polygraph test and passed. Gilberto wasn't the tough person he claimed to be. He didn't have any connection to the cartel or any international operations. He was cleared as a suspect. With friends like these. Jay Ray's disappearance and the police weren't receiving any tips. The police decided to go back to the beginning and review Jay Ray's friends that she had spent time with on October 14, 2012. They soon zeroed in on Cody Godfrey and Tucker McGee. Cody and Tucker didn't change their stories. They claimed to have dropped Jay Ray off at their university apartments. However, there was no one who had heard from Jay Ray after they dropped her off. The police just knew they were hiding something. And my eyeball itches. Oh well, give me time to, to bring some coffee. A grand jury convened in hopes that Tucker and Cody would admit to something while they were under oath. Neither of them changed the stories until Cody decided to admit to what really happened. The police had been planning to give them polygraph tests, but Cody had said he would tell them the truth. Cody said Tucker received a message from Jay Ray asking for a ride. Cody and Tucker showed him a gun and said they killed her. They smoked some synthetic marijuana and picked her up. I keep wanting to say Mary Jahoochee because that's what I they picked her up they drove to the desert area and talked for a few hours cody said they were getting ready to leave so he walked up to the car tucker said he had his gun in his waistband and shot jay ray the side of the head jay ray had been messaging on their phone and hadn't seen it coming cody said he got out of the car and heard jay ray moaning and ground on the ground tucker had become angry and asked him why she wasn't dead cody took and said tucker shot jay ray again this time point blank range to the face Cody said he felt as if they had no choice but to help Tucker move the J-Ray body. They drove back into town and discarded J-Ray's item in the dumpster. Cody, Tucker, and another friend, Caleb, returned to the area next morning and buried J-Ray in a shallow grave. Shortly before she died, J-Ray had texted her friend she was with. Tucker said she felt sketched out. I'm still questioning if sketched out meant that uh, she doesn't feel right or kind of sketchy you know that kind of stuff but yeah so cody then asked tucker if he got rid of the gun and tucker said it's gone the police decided at first he was very uncooperative police said came a look down and read the messages on the cap of his energy drink which said everyone knows Caleb told them everything. The story matched Cody's. So, which you know, I've already read the arrest. So, that was about it. So, final thoughts. J. Ray didn't get the justice she deserved. Only one of her killers are in prison and could get possibly paroled someday. It's scary because he's obviously a dangerous individual. There's not really much emotion. It seems that Tucker was fascinated with just being like Dexter and decided to kill Jerry because she needed the ride that day. All three of them should be in prison right now. So, yep. Well, ladies and gentlemen, that is about, that's it. That's all. Y'all have a wonderful day, wonderful time. And until next time, au revoir.